All right, Galatians 4, another chapter that's just packed full of doctrine. We've got all kinds of things I want to get to tonight, so I'm going to try to be as, as thorough but as quick as possible getting through this stuff. Um, there, there really is so much doctrine in these chapters. Let's jump right in here, verse number 1. The Bible says, Now I say that the heir, as long as he is a child, differeth nothing from a servant, though he be lord of all, but is under tutors and governors, until the time appointed of the father. Now, um, this verse here it says, as long as he is a child. Notice, it doesn't say as long as he is a son. Um, that's, that may be one way people might get confused by this verse. If you read it that way, of saying that the heir, well, as long as he's a son, he doesn't differ from a servant. No, it's as long as he's a child. And what, the, what all this is referring to is that um, an heir, so someone who is a son of the, the head of the household or whatever, right? So like the man of the house, whoever's a state they're growing up in. Uh, this is talking about someone who has servants and he has children. Well, the children, when they're growing up, as long as they're still a child, they're basically no different than the servant is what, is, is what this is saying. It's like, you know what? This guy has servants and he has children. And as long as you're a child, you're still just like a servant. Why? Because... As the child is growing, they've got tutors, they've got governors, they've got people instructing them, they've got other figures of authority, even though one day they're going to grow up and they'll be the ones in charge and they'll be running the people that were teaching them and they'll be, you know, over the whole place, over the whole house. Until that time, as long as they're still children, they're just like the servants. They're kind of on par with the servants, so to speak, even though they're heirs even though they're going to receive this inheritance. And, um, you know, of course, this is humanly, even though he will one day inherit everything and be Lord over the whole house while he's a child, he's basically just like a servant. Let's keep reading here, verse number three. There's a reason why he's, he's bringing this up because he's going to make um, a connection here. He's using this as an illustration for a greater spiritual truth. He's using a physical example of a child and a house yeah, he's an heir, but he's, he's just like the other servants because he's underneath tutors and governors. And that's, that's exactly what he says here. He says he's under tutors, he's under governors until the time appointed of the father. So until that time comes, he needs to be taught and underneath this authority. Verse number three, even so we, so now he's going to make the application. When we were children, we're in bondage under the elements of the world. But when the fullness of the time was come, God sent forth his son made of a woman made under the law to redeem them that were under the law that we might receive the adoption of sons. So what he's saying here, he's not saying, you know, it, you got to be careful because he's trying to make one real simple point. And the point is that before you're saved, you're under a schoolmaster. You're under the tutor of the law. We are all under this law that's going to point us and instruct us and direct us and direct us to Christ. So when we do become saved, when we do put our faith in Jesus Christ, then we become the heirs and then we become uh, adopted children. That's what it says, that we might receive the adoption of sons. So it's, um, he, he's likening the way that a child is just like a servant. He's, he's under tutors, he's under governors, he's got people talking to him until the time appointed of the father. Well, even so we, before we get saved, we're under the, the school master of the, you know, of the law and that teaches us, that shows us and points us to Christ. And then we become um, redeemed from under the law and we receive the adoption of sons. And that's the, the transition that, that he's likening um, and, and making an example of here. Let's keep reading here, verse number six. And because ye are sons, so now you're sons because you're born again, right? We're born into God's family. And because ye are sons, God hath sent forth the spirit of his son into your hearts, crying, Abba, Father, so because you're sons, because you're born again, God has given you the spirit of his son into your hearts. Jesus resides with us. The Holy Ghost dwells within every believer, crying, Abba, Father, to be able to speak 
to you the Father, verse number seven, wherefore thou art no more a servant, but a son, and if a son, then an heir of God through Christ. The relationship changes. See, and again, he's using that illustration of the relationship that the child has growing up in the house is just like a servant. He's not anything special until the time appointed. When we're not saved, we're just like, you know, we're just these servants that we're just like, we're, we're not in the family, right? But once we put our faith in Christ, once we're born again, then our relationship or our status does change because now we're sons. Now we're heirs. Now we are more than just the servants, the, like the fellow servants that, that, did, that weren't born again. And, um, and, and, and this is awesome. I love thinking about this. Keep your place here in Galatians. Let's flip over to Ephesians chapter 1, just a couple pages to the right. Being an heir, it's an awesome thing to comprehend because we're, when we're born again, we become children of God. Now, you could think about this just for a second in terms of like physically on this earth. All the advantages and how cool it might be to be born into a family where you have a rich, powerful, whatever, you know, some family that has all of this stuff or all this wealth or, or, or whatever, right? That, that people look, they look at that and think, oh man, that would be cool to be born into that, right? To just be an heir knowing that your father is already amassed all this wealth and all these things and, and whatever. And I was born into that and now I'm going to receive this when I get older and when they pass, you know, how much greater it is knowing that God is our father and that we were begotten, we were born again through the spirit and that we are God's children and he says that we are heirs together with Jesus Christ, the only begotten son of God that we are adopted sons with him and through him we become a son of God. And, and all of the things, I mean, God possesses everything, right? And he's laid out an inheritance for his children. It's just really exciting to think about that. And when you really let these words sink in, hey, we are heirs, we are sons. And, and, and no matter how bad you think your life is going or things in this world I mean, just take a second to stand back and think about that, is that I just have to endure this life for as long as, you know, however many years God has for me here. And after that, there is an inheritance. I am an heir and nothing's going to change that. You are, an, if you're a child of God, you are an heir. And once you're born again, you can't be unborn. Hey, hallelujah, praise the Lord. Isn't that just awesome to think about that? Being an heir means we have an inheritance. The inheritance is sure because we are in the family. Look at Ephesians 1, verse number 18. The Bible says, The eyes of your understanding being enlightened, that you may know what is the hope of his calling and what the riches of the glory of his inheritance in the saints. And what is the exceeding greatness of his power to us who believe according to the working of his mighty power. And that's talking about the riches of the glory of his inheritance. His inheritance to us, to the saints, to believers. That's awesome. That's just, that's just one glimpse of, this, of the talk about the inheritance. Jesus Christ mentioned in John 14, too. You don't have to turn there. He said, in my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you, I go to prepare a place for you. Again, just another reference to an inheritance to what we're going to see. Girls, sit up and pay attention. We're heirs. Jesus is preparing a place. God's house has many mansions. I mean, again, you think about this world and mansions in this world, oh, how cool that would be. That's nothing compared to what God has. We, who cares about the stuff on this earth when you think about the glories in heaven and the inheritance that we receive through no virtue of our own just because we're, we have become born again, because God loved us enough to adopt us as his children. That's awesome. 1 Corinthians 2.9 also says this. You could turn back if you would to Galatians 4, but just in reference again to this inheritance. The Bible says, But as it is written, I hath not seen nor ear heard, neither have entered into the heart of man the things 
which God hath prepared for them that love him. God has prepared things for us. God has prepared things for those that love him. And he's like, you haven't seen it, you haven't heard it, and it hasn't even entered into your heart fully what God has prepared. It's, it's that amazing that like we, we can't even really fully understand it until, until we get there. And that's just a good, another, another um, reason to hope. Galatians chapter 4, let's, let's go back here. I just, I just wanted to make a real quick pit stop on that, on being an heir and receiving an inheritance. Because it is exciting, it's really good news. And with all the hard preaching, you know, it's, it's good every once in a while to stop and focus in a little bit on just this, this real positive, uplifting, edifying thought of having an inheritance. What, what a joy to look forward to of, of inheriting whatever, whatever God has prepared for us, whatever that is, and knowing how good God is and how merciful and long-suffering and everything that's great about God. And we, we, can't, we can't even understand at this point how great it's going to be. Man, that's, that's exciting. Let's keep reading here. Verse number 8. How be it then, when ye knew not God, ye did service unto them, which by nature are no gods. And before you were saved, before you even knew who God was, you did service unto these false gods. I know that, you know, people are Catholic, people are whatever, all these different religions, and you do service to whatever God that you think is, you know, you're, you're kind of going through the motions or whatever. He says, before you knew God, you just did service. These are no gods. But now, verse 9, now after that you have known God, or rather are known of God, how turn ye again to the weak and beggarly elements whereunto ye desire again to be in bondage? He's saying, you know, before you were saved, I get it. Everybody is serving some false god or whatever before you get saved. He's saying, but now, after that, you've known God. And I love how he puts this, or rather, are known of God. There is a distinction there. There's a difference between knowing God and you having the knowledge and all, you know, whatever, however much knowledge of God and God knowing you. Remember in Matthew chapter 7 when, when people were saying, Lord, Lord, have we not prophesied in thy name and thy name cast out devils and thy name done many wonderful works? And then shall I say unto them in that day, depart from me, you workers of iniquity, I never knew you. They weren't known of God. Why? Because they weren't sons. They weren't children. They weren't ever born in his family. He didn't know them. He said, I don't know you. And that's what's really important for our salvation. What, what matters more than anything is God knowing us, right? You may not be the best child. You may not know your father very well. But what's the most important is that he knows that you're his son, that you are a child of God. That's what matters the most. Now, we ought to know our father, we ought to do our best to try to know him and try to please him and, and everything else. But what really, and what, what the Apostle Paul is, is just bringing out here is just, just their salvation because they already apparently don't know their father because they're getting mixed up in all this work, salvation crap and just, every, just all this other garbage. They're getting turned around and he's just saying like, but now after that you've known God or rather are known of God. How turn ye again to the weak and beggarly? He said, how can you go back to that stuff? How can you turn back to those things that you came out of? Whereunto you desire again to be in bondage. Works bring you into bondage. When that's what you're trusting in for salvation, it's, it's bondage. Because you're under a curse. You're not free from, from the law when, when you're, you're thinking everything comes through the law. Verse number 10 he says, look at this. he says, you observe days and months and times and years. They're going back to just being an observer of times. It's like witchcraft stuff. Verse number 11, I am afraid of you, lest I have bestowed upon you labor in vain. And I, I've mentioned this in other sermons, but I'll br briefly cover it here. You know, Paul has been laboring in the gospel and teaching them and here they are getting back into this witchcraft and astrology and their observing of times, days, weeks, year, you know. It's, the astrology is, is what the people look at, you know. Oh, you were born on this day. 
and here's your horoscope for the day and all this other garbage. That's an observer of times. Why? Because everything they're basing off of is the time. They're, they're looking at the times and the days and the months and, oh, it's December and whatever day. You know, here's your daily horoscope. And that stuff is of the devil. That stuff is wicked. I know a lot of people kind of joke around with it, but I wouldn't even joke with it or mess with it. Don't go to some witch that's going to give you your horoscope. That is of the devil. The Bible says that witches ought to be put to death. That's how God feels about it. It's not a joke. It's not something to make a mockery of even. It's just something that ought to be avoided altogether. It's something, honestly, that ought to be illegal and punishable by death. But the Apostle Paul here, as he's saying, is like, how are you going back to this? You, you've known God, and now you're going back to this? And that's why he's saying, I'm in doubt of you. I'm standing here in doubt of you. Like, are you even saved? Are you even saved if you're going back to this stuff? You're getting caught up with these people talking about work salvation and everything else. He's thinking, like, did I just waste my time preaching and preaching and, you know, trying to get through to you, thinking I got you saved? That's... It's, it's reasonable for him to think this way. Now, as we go through, ultimately, we still think he, he still is giving them the benefit of the doubt that they got saved and everything, but he's really laying into them like this is totally unacceptable. I mean, imagine if someone like the Apostle Paul just started laying into you going, I don't even know if you're saved. If you were saved and getting into all kinds of sin and wicked, you'd just be like, whoa, you know, like I better check myself and get right. And you know what? Sometimes that's what people need to hear. Verse number 12. The Bible says, Brethren, I beseech you, be as I am, for I am as ye are. Ye have not injured me at all. He's saying, like, it doesn't hurt me. You can do whatever you want. And it's the same way today. I mean, you could, people can do whatever they want. You, you, could, you could come to this church. You could not come to this church. It's not going to hurt me if you don't come to church. You're only going to be hurting yourself. It's not going to hurt me if, um, you know, whatever, you get in, that, you go and join some other religion or whatever, you know, it doesn't hurt me at all. It doesn't injure me. And that's what the Apostle Paul said here, you know. He's saying, look, be as I am, for I am as ye are. You have not injured me at all. Verse 13, ye know how through infirmity of the flesh I preached the gospel unto you at the first, and my temptation which was in my flesh ye despised not nor rejected but received me as an angel of God, even as Christ, even as Christ Jesus. Now, his temptation that he's referring to here is this thorn in his flesh. It's, it's, it's a problem that he's been smitten with. And a temptation is a trial. So he's not talking about like being tempted with sin. He's talking about he has a physical ailment that is a trial for him in his life to do the work he's doing and everything else. And um, it, it's something that he has to deal with. But he's saying, the temptation that I had, which was in my flesh, and it was apparently outward because people were able to see it and know about it. He says, you didn't despise that. You still received me. You still listened to me. So, I mean, think about if someone came to you and they had some problem in their flesh. Maybe they had some real nasty growth on their face and it was pussy and nasty, and you're just like, I don't want to have anything to do with them be just because they have, the, you know, they have this problem. And I don't know exactly what Paul's problem was, but it was something along the lines of him saying, you know, where he's able to say, you know, I had this temptation in my flesh. I had this infirmity in my flesh. I had something causing me problems, yet you still received me. You still listened to me. So it was something that, they could have easily turned him away because, oh, you're weird, you've got some problems, don't come near me, right? But they didn't behave that way with the Apostle Paul. Um, he says, you didn't despise me nor reject me, but you received me as an angel of God, even as Christ Jesus. You opened up the doors for me, you received me, and what I was going through was like no problem at all for you. And this is the way that we ought to be towards people anyways, right? But... Um, I believe that this physical ailment that he's referring to here most likely had to do with his eyes. Now, not that it's necessarily a big deal, but we see some other indications of this because this is a serious thing that he's referencing here, having this temptation in his flesh and his infirmity. 
And at the end of Galatians in chapter 6, in verse 11, he says, Ye see how large a letter I have written unto you with mine own hand. So him writing the letter, first of all, was he, he felt it was very necessary for him to directly write the letter to the Galatians. And I think he's also proving a point because most of the epistles of Paul, when you read the Bible, you'll see, you'll notice, if you're paying attention, especially at the last chapters or at the beginning, he'll be referencing people, you know, usually at the end, someone else will sign off, like I, Tertius, who wrote this epistle, but it's really the epistle of Paul. Why? Because Paul was dictating. Paul was speaking as the Holy Ghost moved him, and another man is writing down the words and penning down the epistle to send off. And then the Apostle Paul would verify it and then sign off and, and give maybe a couple verses or whatever uh, of, of him, you know, saluting them or, or blessing them or whatever. And, and he used kind of his, his trademark to, to sign off so that they knew it really was from the Apostle Paul. Because they're getting things in different handwriting, and, but then they see, okay, well, the Apostle Paul signed this. It's from him. We know it's from him. But the letter to the Galatians was serious enough that he's like, I'm writing this letter. It's obviously from his heart. He's obviously trying to get through to them. He's just probably at his wit's end going, how can these people, you know, I've invested so much time in them. Are they even saved? And, and, and it's so personal that he writes the letter on his own. And I think it's a big deal that Besides the, the, the emotional part of the, the, you know, him, him kind of pouring himself into it, is that he's writing a, led, a, a letter, and it's long. That's what he's saying, how large a letter. Like, uh, I've written all of this to you with mine own hand. I think because the problem had to do with his eye, that it wasn't easy for him to write due to his affliction. Now, another reason I believe this is found in 2 Corinthians 12. You could turn there if you'd like. But... Um, 2 Corinthians 12, he, mesh, he, he also uh, references the infirmity in his flesh, the problems that he was having, and that God allowed him to go through that, even though he was entreating God to, to take away the problem that he was having. 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, the Bible says, um, I, I, and you know, this isn't very, very clear. It may not be what I think it is. I'll just say that right after. I'm not just like saying this absolutely is correct. I'm just saying this is what it seems to me to be. But I think that he, this is the same infirmity, and I think it has to do something with his face or with his eyes that might affect his vision or his ability to write letters, and something that's definitely visible because they didn't despise him for it. But in 2 Corinthians 12, verse 7, the Bible says, unless I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelation. So, He's explaining here that he has, the Apostle Paul was given a lot of revelations, was he not? I mean, look at how much of the New Testament is attributed to the Apostle Paul and his writings, his epistles. So he is mightily being used of God. He's getting churches started. He's getting people saved. He has all of this prophecy and all of this knowledge, and God is really using him. And what God does is he allows, he, he makes sure that the Apostle Paul doesn't get lifted up too high and elevated above his measure because of how much God's using him. Because that's natural thing is for people to go to really idolize someone because they're doing such a great work for God. Instead of giving God the glory, they start, you know, giving man a little bit too much of that honor. Now, you know, men doing a good, a good work for God, the Bible says, you know, they that, that labor in the Word, you know, they're worthy of double honor. Of course, we should honor them and, and take care of them and everything else. But God's, I mean, there's a lot that the Bible is doing here. So here's what he says, Lest I should be exalted above measure through the abundance of the revelations, there was given to me a thorn in the flesh, the messenger of Satan to buffet me, lest I should be exalted above measure. So he's saying that, this messenger of Satan had to come and, and God allowed him to attack him and to bring him down, take him down a notch so he's not exalted too high. And again, he says he buffeted him. It could be figurative, but I, I mean, if he, got, if he received some type of a wound. I mean, think about all the times the Apostle Paul was stoned and, 
and beat up and shipwreck and everything else happened to him, he could have very easily had a, a physical problem where, you know, he got, he got punched a little too hard or a rock thrown at him or whatever. And um, it obviously wouldn't have looked very good on his face, whatever, you know, whatever damage was done, a wound. And, um, and anyways, I'll just keep reading here. Verse number eight says, For this thing I besought the Lord thrice that it might depart from me. So he keeps on going to God three times. He's just like, God, you know, can you help me with this? Can you, can you, you know, make this go away? Can you help me out? Verse number nine, and he said unto me, my grace is sufficient for thee, for my strength is made perfect in weakness. Most gladly, therefore, will I rather glory in my infirmities that the power of Christ may rest upon me. Therefore, I take pleasure in infirmities and in reproaches and necessities in persecutions, in distresses for Christ's sake. For when I am weak, then am I strong. It is a great attitude to have. You know, we can entreat the Lord when you have problems. Yeah, go to God, pray to God about it. But if God allows you to go through that, the attitude that we ought to have is not a bitter one, not one where we're angry at God saying, well, God is not listening to me. You know, no, maybe he is. But he says, look, my grace is sufficient for you. I've already bestowed grace upon grace on you. That's enough. My strength is made perfect in weakness. And you could just say, well, then maybe God just needs to be glorified a little bit more and I'll continue going through what I'm going through and I'll be real weak but I'm going to be weak and still preaching God. And think about how much more of an impact that may have on people that can look at someone like Job who lost everything and still praise God. What a great testimony, right? Someone who's going through all kinds of problems. Well, you're serving God and you got beat up and now you got these problems. Well, why isn't God healing you and taking care of you? Praise God, right? And still maintain that integrity and still maintain the faith and devotion to the Lord that speaks volumes. When people, just like when people are willing to give their lives and be martyred for the cause of Christ. Instead of being angry, God, why aren't you protecting me and taking care of me? You're allowing all this to happen. That's not the attitude we ought to have. We ought to be, hey, well, praise the Lord. I'm weak, but God's strong. And we're gonna we're gonna make God we're gonna exalt God's name even higher through our weaknesses and just rejoice in it. That's the attitude that we ought to have. Go back if you go to Galatians chapter four. So he references his problems a couple times, you know, in Second in, in Corinthians twelve as well as in Galatians that he's that he's having here, and I think we ought, we could learn from that. Oh, I think I skipped this verse, too, because I, I, uh, I went ahead to Galatians 6 when I, when I pointed out, you see how large a letter I've written unto you with my own hand. In Galatians chapter 4, verse 15, he says, Where is then the blessedness he spake of? For I bear you record that if it had been possible, ye would have plucked out your own eyes and have given them to me. And I think that's the most clear reason, you know, that's the, the, the most clear verse as to why I think it has to do with his eyes. You know, everything else is kind of supporting, but he's saying, you would have given your eyes for me. Like, that's the way they received him. Why, why would he mention that they would have plucked out their own eyes for him unless his problem was with his eyes, right? If he has a problem with his arm, he's saying, well, you would have cut off your own arm and given it to me, or, you know, because obviously he's not going to be able to use their eyes. It's figurative, but he's saying that that's how much you love me. That's how well you received me. But the problem apparently seems to be with his eyes, that he was having some type of issue you know, blindness, whatever. I've heard some people say that, you know, maybe this was a result of him seeing the bright light on his road to Damascus and stuff. I don't, I don't take it that far. I don't, I don't think that's necessarily what it's from. I think it's more likely has to do with the messenger of Satan buffeting him, like he said, not the Lord Jesus Christ appearing to him in glory. So I don't buy into the, the he was, that's an after effect of him being blinded by the, the, the glory of Jesus. I think it has more to do with him probably getting beaten or stoned or whatever for the cause of Christ. But uh, let's go back to Galatians 4 here. Galatians 4 verse 16. Am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? And this is sad. It's unfortunate. But a lot of people will have this attitude. But we cannot be deterred 
and you need to continue preaching the truth. So many people get offended because someone loves you enough to tell you the truth. And sometimes you, you need someone to love you in order for them to tell you the truth. This has to go with maintaining a humble attitude. If someone ever comes to you and rebukes you, don't get offended. And I don't care who you are and I don't care who they are because it doesn't matter. If they're speaking the truth, because that's key, if they're speaking the truth, if you're rebuked and someone's rebuking you with the truth, then we ought to be able to receive that and not hate that person because they made you upset. Because I don't want to hear the truth. I don't want to be confronted with the truth. Now, if someone's lying about you or, li or, or falsely accusing you or don't have their facts right or whatever, that's a different story, you know. I'm still, you know, I still don't think you just be bitter against people, but um, when someone tells you the truth, as the Apostle Paul is obviously doing here, he's telling them the truth. He's saying, am I now your enemy? You know, like, you're going to count me as an enemy because I tell you the truth. The Bible says in Proverbs 27, 5, open rebuke is better than secret love. It's better for someone to, it's better for you to openly rebuke someone, and, then, and think about this, than it is to just have secret love for someone like this. Like, oh yeah, I love that person, but you never say anything, you don't do anything about it. Hey, it's a lot better to get a rebuke than, than to even never know about the love. So, and then it's, but then it follows that up with faithful are the wounds of a friend. Your friend may wound you or tell you things that you don't really want to hear. But if they're telling you the truth, that's a faithful friend. That's, a good, that's someone that actually does care about you. It says, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Right? You could have an enemy telling you all kinds of things that you want to hear, but they're an enemy. They don't really love you. They have it out for you, but they're just flattering you or telling you things you want to hear. That's, but it's ultimately they don't have your... Um, benefit in mind. But your friend does. Someone who loves you and cares about you does. So if your friend wounds you because they rebuke you or whatever, well, they have your, your best interest in mind because they're your friend because they do love you. And we need to remember that, that we don't just go running to our enemies that may flatter us in the short term because in the end, it's going to be bad for you. Stick with your friend that you know loves you even if they rebuke you and just be humble enough to receive correction. If they're, if they're rebuking you in, in love and in the truth, don't make them your enemy. They're just trying to help. Galatians 4, look at verse number 17. The Bible says, They zealously affect you, but not well. So this is in kind of, remember, we just read, am I therefore become your enemy because I tell you the truth? They zealously affect you, but not well. Yea, they would exclude you that you might affect them. What he's trying to explain here is that I'm not the enemy. They are the ones who are coming in and twisting your minds around and bewitching you with these works, this workspace salvation and this circumcision. He's saying they're zealously affecting them. They have zeal and they're getting them all fired up, right? They're coming in and they're preaching their sermons that are full of heresy and false doctrine, but they're getting everyone fired up. Yeah, they're affecting you zealously, but not well because it's not good. It's not true. It's not right. The Apostle Paul said, I'm coming in truth and now I'm your enemy. He's saying, yeah, they, would, they want to exclude you because they're the enemy. Because faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy are deceitful. Verse 18, But it is good to be zealously affected always in a good thing, and not only when I am present with you. Say, hey, hey, get zealously affected, but get zealously affected in a good thing. That's good. Yeah, get the zeal. Get zealously affected. Get on fire. Get, get fired up. But do it in a good thing, not in an evil thing. Verse 19, My little children of whom I travail in birth again, until Christ be formed in you, I desire to be present with you now and to change my voice, for I stand in doubt of you. And again, he's just saying, like, I don't think you guys are even saved. 
because just everything that's going on, he's saying, like, I don't need, and I think that's one of the reasons why Galatians is such a great book for salvation, because he's, he's really trying to make things extra clear and saying how it's not of the works of the law, and if, you know, if it's by the works of the law, then Jesus Christ died in vain, and, you know, it's like, it's totally by faith, and, and, and chapter after chapter, he's just, he's just bringing this up again. Why? Because he's standing in doubt, and he's saying, like, I'm traveling, like, I'm working in birth again. Because I don't think you were ever born again, so now I'm traveling in birth again until Christ be formed in you. And so he said, I want to be with you and change my voice. Like, he said, I don't want to have to, to doubt anymore. I'd like to be right there with you and just know for certain whether or not you guys are really saved and, and change my voice and not have to rebuke you with the truth, but rather edify you with the truth. Right? He's saying, I changed my voice, but he's, I stand in doubt of you. Verse 21. Tell me, ye that desire to be under the law, do ye not hear the law? For it is written that Abraham had two sons, the one by a bondmaid, the other by a free woman. But he who was of the bondwoman was born after the flesh, but he of the free woman was by promise, which things are an allegory. For these are the two covenants, the one from the Mount Sinai, which gendereth the bondage, which is Agar. For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answer to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. Now I want to pause here for a minute, just because what the story he's bringing up here is of Abraham and Sarah. God promised to Abraham that he was going to have a son and that God was going to bless him, and that his seed was going to be like, the, you know, the stars in the heaven, or the sand by the sea, like there's this multitude, right? And he was going to be a father of many nations, and God was going to bless him, and this is what God promised him. But as Abraham got older, he began to have some doubts, and Sarah suggested to Abraham, well, why don't you go into my handmaid, whose name was Hagar? And she was their servant. And he says, well, take her physically and have a child with her. And then we'll have a child. We'll raise that child up for ourselves. And then we'll have our son. Well, that was a lapse in faith because... God didn't seem to be coming through with the promise. So they're like, well, maybe he wants, you know, and, and, and when people wait a while, unfortunately, we start to think dumb thoughts because <laughs> that's what it was. And they're thinking, well, maybe what God meant by we'll have a baby is if we do it this way, you know, and kind of meddle and, and well, we need to help God out a little bit here. So let's, let's try this. And, that birth of Ishmael, because that's who was born of, of the handmaid, was Ishmael. Ishmael is being referred to here as someone who's born after the flesh, because that's the best that they can do. He wasn't the child that God promised, because he promised a child to Sarah that Sarah was going to give birth. Sarah did not give birth to Ishmael. He was not the child of promise. He is a child of the flesh, because that's what happens when people come together. When a man and a woman lie together and they have their relationship, a child comes, right? That's a work of the flesh. And that was them trusting in their flesh to do this. And he's explaining that, all, that whole story with everything that happened, that's an allegory. It's an illustration. It's, there's, there's, there's a greater truth and a greater meaning for us to learn from that. And he says, Abraham had two sons, which he did, Isaac and Ishmael. The one by a bondmaid, one that was a servant under his rule, under his law. And this whole chapter, you know, is tied in with the heir versus being a servant. You know, we started off in verses 1 and 2 talking about, you know, a child, as, lo as long as he is a child. An heir, as long as he is a child, differs nothing from a servant. It's talking about servants. It's talking about heirs. He has this bondwoman. The bondwoman isn't an heir. The bondwoman's just a servant in his household. She had a son that was born after the flesh. But the free woman, Sarah, his wife, had the child that was by promise. That was done the right way. That was done within marriage. That was done according to the promise of God. 
The, one, the other one was done outside of the marriage. It was done wickedly. It was done through the flesh and is in bondage, is under bondage. It's, that's not, that was not the way to go. He says these are an allegory for these are the two covenants. So he's explaining these are symbolic or re you reference the two covenants, the one from Mount Sinai. So one covenant comes from Mount Sinai. What covenant is that? That's a covenant of the law. That's where Moses received the Ten Commandments. That's where Moses went to. He went to Mount Sinai to communicate with the Lord and to receive the law. And the law brings the bondage. He says the, the two children, one is, they represent two covenants. The child of the flesh represents Mount Sinai, which gendereth to bondage, which is Agar. Agar was the name of the servant woman. And then verse 25 says, For this Agar is Mount Sinai in Arabia, and answereth to Jerusalem, which now is, and is in bondage with her children. So at the time, he's talking about Jerusalem, which now is, was the Jews, the Pharisees, right? Their law. Their, they thought that being saved had to do with obeying God's law. That, they, they were totally into the works and the Mosaic law, and they were worried that Jesus came to destroy the law and all this other stuff, because... That's where they thought their salvation was in that covenant of the law. And of course, none of them were able to live up to it. They were all damned, but they were proud and thought that they were able to do it. Now, um, so that's where he's, he's referring to Agar's Mount Sinai in Arabia and answers to Jerusalem, which now is and is in bondage with her children. They're under bondage. They're under the curse of the law. Verse 26, but Jerusalem, which is above, is free, which is the mother of us all. So this is referring to, now it draws a distinction between Jerusalem, which now is, and Jerusalem, which is above. Two different Jerusalems. The Jerusalem above is the mother of us all, according to this passage. The physical, it's, it's just like Ishmael was the physical seed through the flesh. But that's not the promise. Isaac represents the promise. The Jerusalem that now is, Israel that now is in the Middle East over there, that's all like Ishmael. That's like the flesh. That does not have anything to do with God's promises. That's why we don't care about that. That's why we don't care about the physical descendants of Abraham. Because as an allegory, that's what God's saying, that he, you know, nothing was ever going to come through Ishmael, through the flesh. It's all coming through the promise. And Jerusalem, which is above, that's the promise. That's the inheritance. We're going to inherit Jerusalem, which is above. Who cares about Jerusalem, which is on this earth? We, we, don't, we don't need it. We're not looking at that. We're not looking at this earth for our inheritance. We're looking to heaven. Jerusalem, which is above, is free. It's not under bondage. Turn, if you would, to Ephesians chapter 2. Again, just like another page, a page or two to the right in your Bible. We're going to see a few references here to the new Jerusalem or the, you know, where our, we need to be heavenly minded. Um, verse number 4 in Ephesians 2, the Bible says, But God, who is rich in mercy for his great love, wherewith he loved us, even when we were dead in sins, hath quickened us together with Christ. By grace are you sa ye are saved and hath raised us up together and made us sit together in heavenly places in Christ Jesus. That's, he's talking about our heavenly home in Christ. Jump down to verse number 12. That at that time ye were without Christ, being aliens from the commonwealth of Israel and strangers from the covenants of promise, having no hope and without God in the world. He's saying, you know, at the time when you were without Christ, before you had Christ, you were strangers, you were foreigners, you were not part of Israel, you were strangers from the covenants of promise, the covenants of promise, right? Because that's the one he cares about, not the covenant of the law, the covenant of promise, having no hope without God in the world. But now in Christ Jesus, ye who sometimes were far off are made nigh by the blood of Christ. For he is our peace, who hath made both one, and hath broken down the middle wall of partition between us, having abolished in his flesh the enmity, even the law of commandments, 
contained in ordinances for to make in himself of twain one new man, so making peace, and that he might reconcile both unto God in one body by the cross, having slain the enmity thereby, and came and preached peace to you which were afar off and to them that were nigh. For through him we both have access by one spirit unto the Father. Now therefore ye are no more strangers and foreigners, but fellow citizens with the saints and of the household of God. Now he's talking about a few different things here, but obviously he's referring to the fact that they're Gentiles and there's Jews and, and he's saying, you know what? God's broken down the middle wall and there's no difference between us and that when faith came, hey, you that were far off, now you're fellow citizens of Israel. And it's the true Israel. It's a spiritual Israel. He's, he's not talking about the physical nation. He doesn't care about that. He cares about Jerusalem, which is above. He cares about that inheritance, that heavenly inheritance that is going to be our eternal home. That's going to come down out of heaven one day and we'll have the new Jerusalem on earth. Because this, old, this current one is, is of the flesh. And it's going to be done away with. And it's under bondage even to this day. There's nothing special about this Jerusalem. It's the heavenly Jerusalem that we care about. And in Hebrews chapter 11, turn if you would to Hebrews. Hebrews 11, we get more references in Hebrews 11 and 12 about the heavenly Jerusalem, about our, where, where we are to be focused on and have our, our minds set on. Hebrews 11, verse number 13 the Bible reads, These all died in faith, not having received the promises, but having seen them afar off, and were persuaded of them, and embraced them, and confessed that they were strangers and pilgrims on the earth. And again, Hebrews 11 is the faith chapter. It's talking about Moses. It talks about Abraham. It talks about all these people of faith, right? And he says that they, they confessed. They already admitted, yeah, we're strangers. We're pilgrims. We don't care about the physical Israel and Jerusalem on this earth. We're just passing through. We're strangers on this earth. Why? Because we have a home in heaven. He's going to get to this in just a minute. Verse 14. For they that say such things declare plainly that they seek a country. We're, we're looking for a country. We're looking for our home. Verse 15. And truly, if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out, they might have had opportunity to have returned. But now they desire a better country, that is, an heavenly Wherefore, God is not ashamed to be called their God, for he hath prepared for them a city. God's prepared them a heavenly city. The men of faith in Hebrews 11, they were looking for this heavenly city. They gave up their earthly city. They didn't care about that anymore. So if they had opportunity, they might return. He said, but no, they're actually looking for and desire a better country. They want something better than what this world has to offer. They're looking for their inheritance which is in heaven. And for that reason, the Bible says that God's not ashamed to be called their God. Because these people get it. They don't care about this earth stuff. They're looking for their inheritance in heaven. And that's what we ought to be focused on too. Hebrews 12, flip over one chapter, Hebrews 12, verse number 22, Hebrews 12, the Bible says, But ye are come unto Mount Sion, and unto the city of the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, and to an innumerable company of angels, to the general assembly and church of the firstborn, which are written in heaven, and to God, the judge of all, and to the spirits of just men made perfect, and to Jesus, the mediator of the new covenant, and to the blood of sprinkling that speaketh better things than that of Abel. So again, we're come unto Mount Zion, the living God, the heavenly Jerusalem, innumerable company of angels. This is what the new Jerusalem is going to be like. It's the general assembly and church of the firstborn. Why? Because everyone's going to be assembled together in one place. It's going to be awesome. Revelation 21 has another reference to the new Jerusalem coming down out of heaven. Revelation 21.1 says, And I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth were passed away, and there was no more sea. And I, John, saw the holy city, new Jerusalem, coming down from God out of heaven, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And then in verse number 9 it says, And there came unto me one of the seven angels, which had the seven vials full of the seven last plagues and talked with me saying, come hither, I will show thee the bride, the lamb's wife. And what is the bride? What is the lamb's wife? It's the holy city. It's very simple. Verse number 10, and he carried me away in the spirit to a great and high mountain and showed me that great city, the holy Jerusalem descending out of heaven from God. 
having the glory of God, and her light was like unto a stone, most precious, even like a jasper stone. And then it goes on and on and describes this holy city and how, how cool it is and, and just, just what it looks like. And you can read the rest of that chapter later. Let's go back to Galatians chapter 4. We're going to finish off this chapter here real quick. There's so much content. I, I'm kind of blowing through a lot of it. I could, I could spend an entire sermon just talking about the New Jerusalem. I had to take an entire sermon talking about an inheritance and talking about just you know, all this stuff. Um, there's so much packed in here. But let's try to get through the rest of this chapter because we've still got a few more verses to go here. Verse number 27. The Bible says, For it is written, Rejoice, thou barren that bearest not, break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. And again, this is in reference to spiritual things, not physical things. He's saying, Rejoice if you're barren, if you don't have any children right now. Break forth and cry, thou that travailest not, for the desolate hath many more children than she which hath an husband. Why? Well, this applies if you're serving God. Just like the Apostle Paul said, you know, it's good for a man not to touch a woman, nevertheless to avoid fornication, let every man have his own wife. But he was saying, you know, I would that every man were like me. You know, but every man has his proper gift from God. That, you know, if when you have a spouse, you have to care about the things of this world, how you may please your husband or how you may please your wife. And if you don't have that, there's, there's less responsibility for you your, your focus, your attention isn't diverted. So when you're single, when you, don't have, when you don't have a husband or a wife or kids or anything like that, you can devote all of your time to soul winning, to leading people to Christ, to just serving the Lord with your life. That's one thing that people can do. And that's why he's saying, hey, rejoice. You know, even if you want to be, you know, married and have children or whatever, and you're not right now, or you don't have any kids, there's still a reason to rejoice. Why? Because ultimately, the things of these earth, you know, it's still just the physical, fleshly things. Let's focus on the heavenly things. There could be way more that you can be accomplishing then. Use your time here wisely. Now, it doesn't mean that marriage is a bad thing. Marriage is a very good thing. God gave us that. But not everyone will be married. Not everyone gets married when you want to get married. Not everyone has kids when you want to have kids. So wherever you're at, look, there's always a reason to rejoice. Because if you don't have the extra distractions, you can do even more to serve God. And that is going to be increasing your rewards in heaven that don't perish, that don't go away. Verse 28, Now we, brethren, as Isaac was, are the children of promise. Thank God we're children of promise. Romans 4.13, you have to turn to Romans 4.13 says, For the promise that he should be the heir of the world was not to Abraham or to his seed through the law, but through the righteousness of faith. That's where it came from. It's through the righteousness of faith. The, 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 the promise, right? And of course, a promise, I, I went over this before. I'm not going to spend too much time on a promise, but... You have to believe someone when they tell you a promise. You have to. If you're going to accept their promise, say, well, I believe it. God's promised unto us eternal life. Well, I can't see that with my eyes. We just believe it. We believe that uh, we have life that lasts forever because God said so. Because we're taking God at his word because we have faith in God. And the promise that came to Abraham that he was going to be heir of the world, didn't come to him through the law. It's not because he was obeying the law and was, was able to follow the law. No, it, it came to him through the righteousness of faith. That's why he received that. Uh, I'm going to keep reading here in Romans 4, verse 14. The Bible says, For if they which are of the law be heirs, faith is made void and the promises made of none effect. If you can become an heir just by obeying the law, He's saying then you don't need faith. It's, it's none, none effect. The promise doesn't matter then because you can do it all just through the law. You don't need to have faith in a promise. But we can't. Because the law worketh wrath. For where no law is, there is no transgression. Therefore it is of faith that it might be by grace to the end. The promise might be sure to all the seed. Not to that only which is of the law, but to that also which is of the faith of Abraham, who is the father of us all. As it is written... I have made thee a father of many nations. Before him whom he believed, even God who quickeneth the dead, 
and calleth those things which be not as though they were, who against hope believed in hope, that he might become the father of many nations, according to that which was spoken, so shall thy seed be. And being not weak in faith, he considered not his own body now dead, when he was about a hundred years old, neither yet the deadness of Sarah's womb. He staggered not at the promise of God through unbelief, but was strong in faith, giving glory to God, and being fully persuaded that what he had promised he was able also to perform, and therefore was imputed to him for righteousness. Now it was not written for his sake alone that it was imputed to him, but for us also, to whom it shall be imputed if we believe on him that raised up Jesus our Lord from the dead, who was delivered for our offenses and was raised again for our justification. There's so much in that chapter. I was going to preach a lot more through Romans 4, but Galatians 3, Galatians 4, Romans 4, all tied together. And these are all very important. Again, read all these and then read James chapter 2 to get the full picture of what James 2 is talking about. I covered that last week. I'm not going to go into it. But we see here how God made a promise to Abraham. Girls, settle down and sit down and pay attention. God gave Abraham a promise. And basically, it's the same faith and it's the same belief Abraham had that Abraham was trusting in the promise of God that we need today. And Romans 4 explains that very clearly, saying those were written, you know, this applies to us. It's all by promise. Galatians 4.29 says, But as then he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the Spirit, even so it is now. Now, who, is them that are, who are they that are born after the flesh? The physical seed of Abraham. That's the whole context of what we're talking about. People who are physically born, like Ishmael, or like anybody who doesn't have faith. They are the, the, the born after the flesh. You know, and, and specifically, though, the seed of Abraham. The physical seed, those that are born after the flesh, persecuted him that was born after the spirit. That's always been the way it is, it's been. He says, even so it is now, even to this day, he's saying back then in, in Galatians, the physical Jews are persecuting the spiritual Jews, those that have put their faith in Christ. And some of the physical Jews were also spiritual Jews, right? Like the Apostle Paul, he was a, he was a Benjamite. But... He was born of the Spirit, and he was being persecuted by those that were born after the flesh. Stephen mentioned this in his, the, the martyr Stephen in Acts chapter 7. He brought up the same thing, basically, in, in Acts 7.51. He said, Ye stiff-necked and uncircumcised in heart and ears. They're uncircumcised. They're not saved. They're not believers. These are people who were born after the flesh. He says, Ye do always resist the Holy Ghost as your fathers did, so do ye. Which of the prophets have not your fathers persecuted? And they have slain them which showed before of the coming of the just one, of whom ye have been now the betrayers and murderers. He's saying, the prophets... They prophesied of the coming of the just one. They prophesied of Jesus Christ. They were preaching the same message that they're preaching now about Jesus Christ, except now they're preaching that he already came. The, other, the prophets of the Old Testament were preaching his coming. Moses was preaching the coming of Jesus Christ. The prophets, the Old Testament saints, they were preaching the coming of Jesus Christ, and they were persecuted by those that did not believe, by those that were physical seed, they were persecuted. They were slain. They were cast into prison. We read about that in Hebrews 11 as well. Those that were of faith and the persecutions they faced and those persecutions they faced from the physical seed, from those born after the flesh. It's always been that fight. And it's always been the physical seed of Abraham. Yes, the physical Jews that don't believe are the biggest ones fighting against the spiritual Israel. Always. That's the way it's always been. And I can't even tell you why. 
except that I know it's true because it's what God's word says. I mean, it's evident throughout history. Why are they like that? I don't know. Maybe it's just because they were so close to God's word and they've heard so much that they're just reprobate and they're given over to a reprobate mind. I mean, that's the best thing I could think of is that they've had the most opportunity. And when you have the most opportunity and you still reject, then you just go way off into just doing the exact opposite. That's the only thing that even makes sense to me. But it doesn't matter whether I'm right or wrong about that because I know what the Bible says. And he that was born after the flesh persecuted him that was born after the spirit, even so it is now. Stephen continues saying, who have received the law by the disposition of angels and have not kept it. And when they heard these things, they were cut to the heart and they gnashed on him with their teeth. And of course, they, they killed him. Uh, Galatians 4.30, we're almost done. There's two verses left. Four, chapter 4, verse 30. Nevertheless, what saith the scripture? Cast out the bondwoman and her son. That's what was said to, if you remember, when Ishmael was born, Sarah was hated in Hagar's eyes. Because, not, I mean, and this is what happens when you get into sin. You have all these unintended consequences. See, Sarah's thinking, oh, this is going to be great. You could just use her to have this baby, and it'll be our baby and everything else. Well, now her own handmaid, the one who's supposed to be serving her, hated her. And you understand why, because she had this child. Where, well, Sarah couldn't have the child, but she stepped in and was able to. And now she's taking the child and raising it. You know, it's just this big mess. It's a big old mess. But what happened, though, is that Abraham tells Sarah, well, deal with her however you want. Okay, you know, you deal roughly with her, and Sarah dealt roughly with her. And then God even told Abraham, saying, cast out the bondwoman. Just send her away. Why? Because that wasn't part of God's plan at all anyways, and he still wants Abraham to have the child of promise with Sarah. And this thing that he did, this big mistake, this... The, the, this, the sin that he got into, trying to do everything through the flesh, he's like, just cast her out. And God said that that was okay. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. And God said, don't worry. You know, I'll bless him. He'll have a great nation and everything else. But that's not who is a child of promise. And he cast him out. It says, for the son of the bondwoman shall not be heir with the son of the free woman. They don't mix. The bondwoman and the free, they don't go together. He's saying they're not both going to be heirs. Ishmael was not an heir of Abraham. Even though he was his son, it's because he was a son of the bondwoman. He didn't receive inheritance. He was given some gifts or whatever and, and, and cast out. Do you know who inherited all of Abraham's stuff and everything that Abraham had? Isaac did. Because he was the, the, the legitimate heir and he was the child of promise. So he inherited everything. And it's not, I mean, think about what this is saying. Cast out the bondwoman and her son. Israel today, physical Israel, anyone who's a physical descendant of Abraham, you can't rely on that. If they're not born again, guess what? They're going to be cast out. God's not a respecter of person. He doesn't care if they're physically born of Abraham. They are not going to receive any inheritance with those that are the children of promise. With us, with anyone who's a believer in Jesus Christ. Not because we're better than them, but because we are born into God's family and they're not. He says, so cast them out. Because that's what he's going to do. He's not going to allow any physical seed of Abraham to receive of the heavenly inheritance unless they're born again and become spiritual children. It's the only way. Cast out the seed born after the flesh, the physical Jew, the Jews trusting in the law, trusting in their works. Cast them out. They're not heirs with the children of promise. Verse 31, So then, brethren, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. We, the Apostle Paul and Gentiles and anyone else who believes, we are not children of the bondwoman, but of the free. Bow rides have a word of prayer. Dear Lord, we thank you so much for this clear teaching from Scripture, Lord.
I pray that you would please just uh, help to continue to guide us in truth and in knowledge. Dear Lord, help us to be humble. Help us to receive the rebukes of a friend and be able to receive truth and to not get bitter or angry against someone who's trying to help us by telling us the truth. Or, you know what, God, recently maybe uh, by, by warning people and, and bluntly warning people about the dangers of predators and dangers of people who are wicked people, they need to be warned about it. Our brothers and sisters in Christ need to be told about these phonies and these charlatans and these false prophets that come in and are damaging the cause of Christ, dear Lord. And you know what? That might offend some people, but if, if they're going to be able to, I hope they can recognize the, the wounds of a friend and, um, and not get sucked in with the flatteries and the kisses of an enemy. Lord, give us the wisdom to discern that. Help us not to hate those that, that preach the truth, but that we would accept it and, and receive it, dear Lord. And um, God, we just pray all these things in Jesus' name. Amen.